Our first presentation this morning is from Tim McGuire, who is Frank Russell Chair for the Business of Journalism at Arizona State University's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications. He also works with the Center on Disability and Journalism located at ASU. Fasten your seatbelts as we hear from Tim McGuire based on his many years as a managing editor of a newspaper and his current focus on ethics and the future of journalism. Tim, take it away. Tim, are you still there on the phone? Can you unmute? Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Tim. Uh, let me add a few things to that resume that Joanne uh, went through. Uh, I was editor of the Star Tribune in Minneapolis for many years. I uh, am now a uh, hold an endowed chair in the future of journalism at uh, uh, the Cronkite School. But for your interest, uh, you probably also ought to know uh, that I was born uh, with arthrogryposis multicongenita. And I had uh, 13 surgeries before I was 16 years old. Uh, I knew the disability world quite well. Uh, just for added excitement, uh, my wife and I, uh, our middle child, was Down syndrome. And he is Down syndrome. And he's an incredible young man. Uh, he's 35 now, named Jason. He lives in a group home in uh, Minnesota uh, and is uh, happy and thriving in a sheltered workplace, uh, works at a, uh, a gym, Lifetime Fitness, a couple of days a week, uh, works at a Culver's fast food restaurant. So I know your world quite well. Uh, and uh, have observed it. I am right now, in addition to a media blog I write, I write a blog on life, disability, and grief. I lost my wife five months ago. I uh, am also about three weeks away from publishing on Amazon a book called Some People Even Take Them Home. Uh, a disabled dad, a Down syndrome son, and our journey to acceptance, uh, in which I write about uh, Jason and me and our relationship and our individual journeys. So uh, I think that sets up uh, where I am in life. My, my work at ASU is focused on what is happening in media and what is going to happen? Uh, the simple answer is it's blown up. And I will spend the next several minutes talking to you about that. We are in a Schumpeterian moment. The way I tell my students about this is I ask them to imagine that they're in 1908 outside our beautiful new building in downtown Phoenix which uh, was probably a two-story uh, bar or something. And I have them look down the street and see the horses and carriages and the uh, uh, blacksmiths and uh, wagon wheel makers. And I ask them to look down the road. And here comes a uh, brand new Ford off of uh, Ford's uh, assembly line. Put, put, put down the street. That moment signaled the end of the horse and carriage, the blacksmiths, and all the rest. For them, it was a very destructive moment. But we are all aware of how much uh, the auto has changed our country. Uh, it connected our country. It made it uh, uh, unified. It had an incredible effect on how we live. That is a Schumpeterian moment. It is as creative as it is destructive. But focusing on creation is very difficult when the destruction is occurring all around. And so that's why you read so much about how 
the media, both television but especially print, are in crisis. And that crisis is not being underestimated. It is dramatic. The newspaper industry alone has lost over $40 billion in revenue in the last 10 years, from $60 billion to $20 billion. Uh, as uh, Senator Dirksen would have said, that's real money. Uh, and it has been a catastrophe for mainstream media. Uh, and while you read more about uh, print, TV is in equal trouble. What happened? Well, the dynamics changed. In old media, the formula was simple. We edited, you read. It was that easy. But the interactive web made that forced relationship a joke. People can now talk, share, argue, and do business with each other, just as we are today. I find the concept of this uh, exhilarating and just a bit intimidating when you think of us old people who uh, uh, couldn't have imagined this 25 years ago. The newspaper used to be edited on a 24-hour cycle. You will read when we say you can read. TV News brought you news on their schedule. You probably got a newspaper in the morning and you watched Walter Cronkite or Huntley and Brinkley at 6 o'clock at night. Those were your main sources of news and you didn't have a lot of option to get other sources. Now you read, watch, search whenever you want and you demand immediacy. I lived in a world where the media controlled the message. We decided what you read. We decided if that story was worth you knowing. Now all pretenses of control are gone. Blogs, Twitter, Facebook, advocacy sites, they end that control completely. Mainstream media are not deciding what you read anymore. You decide. And this is not a media issue. The digital revolution has diminished the control of every industry you can mention, from banks to insurance. Think about flow on progressive insurance. You can go on a computer and you can compare uh, insurance rates. For those of you uh, who used to deal with the uh, uh, insurance business who wouldn't tell you anything, that's dramatic stuff. My dad used to be in the car business. He had something called the Kelly Blue Book, and we had to keep it in the uh, glove compartment uh, because it was top secret. Now you can get to the Kelly Blue Book in three keystrokes. All pretenses of control are gone. The entire media business was predicated on the bundle. Ads have always gone with editorial content, and commercials go with TV programming. Popular channels go in cable packages along with unpopular ones. TV and newspapers assembled an audience and then sold those eyeballs. They sold your eyeballs. You were of value to advertisers. For advertisers, their targeted market was bundled in the mass. Inefficiency was part of the deal. Tough noogies. We charge for all our subscribers and yet a furniture store simply wanted the people who were interested in couches. But the fact is a very small percentage of that audience actually wanted a couch. The power of the internet kills the bundle. Consumers seek relevant links, not brands. DVRs put you in control of your viewing universe. In fact, you, much of the TV watching that my students do is not according to schedule and it's not on mainstream networks. Some experts believe the legacy companies will be able to hold on to their bundles for a while, but not too long. The second screen and the eventual merger of the first and second screen, and all I mean by the second screen is many of you 
watch television uh, as you're playing with your iPad or your Kindle. Uh, that's the second screen, and it's going to be integrated into your TV soon. So, Ken Doctor is a media and analyst, and he says, the old news world is gone, get over it. And that's really an essential part of my message today. Old print simply could not adjust to digital transformation. They, and if I'm really fair, I should say we, were convinced that we could expand audience and we'd still be at the center of the action. I was part of a team in uh, Minneapolis in 1994. In fact, I led the online uh, effort, and we clearly made the decision to keep our product free because we knew we could expand audience and we would still be the main player. We saw our world as a push world, which we have always viewed. We push news and we would continue to control. But now you pull the news and that old news world is gone. It has changed everything. Inefficiencies will always be discovered. And some of you may, may have discovered that. I like to tell my students I can teach them economics in one sentence. But they don't have to bother with Economics 101. They can take uh, Tim's Economic 101 and they'll be all set. And my one sentence is, that supply and demand stuff, that works. Supply and demand is about abundance and scarcity. We used to have a scarce product. There was only one place in the community to find news. There was only one place to advertise, to dominate the uh, advertising scene, and that was the newspaper. The web has created an abundance of information and advertising ability, availability and old media was based on scarcity. That abundance has made the market more, efficiency, more efficient. Markets will always seek efficiency and inefficient players get killed. And that's what's happened to the media business. A man named Phil Meyer several years ago when newspapers were doing well described newspapers as the advertising toll gate. Everybody in town had to come through the newspaper to advertise. That made for a wealthy business. Newspapers and television stations were rich. Those days are long gone. Newspapers are holding on by fingernails waiting for a miracle. As I said, every major newspaper has declined significantly in ad revenue. Just to give you a, a sense, in 1991, the Star Tribune was making $21 million in job recruitment revenue. By 1998, that newspaper was making 90 nine zero million dollars in help wanted job recruitment revenue. Today, I predict, I'm pretty sure they make about four or five million dollars. 91 million in 98, four or five now. That is an industry that's being absolutely clobbered. And there's some tough truths here. Clay Shirky is a tremendous uh, media critic and observer. And he observes that there's no general model for newspapers to replace the one the Internet just broke. The Internet clearly broke that model. The Internet has made advertising and information ubiquitous, and the control of the uh, old media is simply gone. He argues it makes increasingly less sense even to talk about a publishing industry because the core problem publishing solves, the incredible difficulty, complexity, 
and expense of making something available to the public has stopped being a problem, which is what we're going to discuss. So the real fact is consumers have won. Big companies, not most, so much. Consumers certainly have benefited. They have more choices, speedier delivery of news, and more platforms. As legacy companies shrink, these advantages have often been accompanied by a loss of original news coverage. They simply cannot afford, with profits that are like one-seventh of what they were 12 years ago, they simply cannot afford to put out the news product that they used to. When I left the Star Tribune in 2002, we had a staff of about 395, 400 people. They now have a staff of about 235 people, and without question, they are one of the uh, newsrooms in the country that spend the most on news. Uh, the other issue is news and new entrants have achieved impressive editorial results. Things you perhaps have never heard of, BuzzFeed, Vice, are where the action is today. Uh, many of them have achieved financial stability, but with philanthropic support, but some without, and other non-market support. But the real key is anybody can become a new entrance in, entrant in the news. You have scores of little players getting into the game. In fact, some of you may be in the media game now, and we'll discuss that. The real key is to itch the niche. Match is, mass is dying in the form of general interest newspapers and TV news. Big three networks are declining. Cable niche players are rising. Niches are rising everywhere. If you care a lot about knitting, you can go to a knitting news site. Uh, now, don't leave and race to that site right now, please. Uh, the audience loves niches, and so do advertisers, because with a niche, the, the audience self-defines for you. You know exactly who you're reaching. Big niche players are dominating in sports and business, but as I said, little players are getting into the game. Many of the graduates of the Cronkite School here at Arizona State are going into either their own startups or startup businesses with six or seven or eight other people. Many of them still go to big operations, big TV operations, ESPN, CNN, uh, lots of business uh, television sites, but many of them are going to uh, he women's health sites and other very tightly niched products. Gordon Burrell says the deer now have guns. We, the media, are in the business of hunting prey, the audience. And we need to be aware that our prey, prey is now fully armed to do the same thing. It doesn't necessarily mean that the deer are after us. But the fact is, and you may well be part of this movement, by remixing, rebundling, and making their own media, the audience is now able to attract some of the same eyeballs we used to call our own. We've lost our exclusivity for content creation and distribution in the marketplace. And that's real trouble for an institution that's used to having it all to itself. My main message today is that in a media world that has blown up, with establishment media is a shadow of its former self, you folks can be the deer. The new magic word is loyalty. Loyal readers mean higher ad rates. Loyal is defined by PBSOrgans.org as number of pages a reader views, amount of time a reader spends on the site, how often, and how recently readers have come. 
you can build lawyer, uh, loyalty. The smartphone is the new portal. The epic epoch of the portal is long, long over. It was crushed by the smartphone and the app economy. The fundamental and inevitable shift in behavior by people on the web that happens every few hours. The smartphone replaced the web portal. In its own way, the smartphone became the portal. The window in which you check your email, weather, send an instant message, read news on your favorite topics, and I hope keep up with my blog. Of course, there was an app for that and everything else. The future of the media will be streamed. The old business model for music and movies was to drive consumers through the doors. We all know fewer people walk through the doors these days. Digitization of music devastated music stores and movie ticket sales are declining. Both are in structural decline because music and movie streaming operations are in ascendancy. Think back to my Schumpeterian moment. So many businesses are in this structural decline. Things are being destroyed, but so much more is being created. One of the big reasons for that is that it, there's zero cost of distribution. That's a real opportunity. Proprietary distribution, where you have to tune into a channel or buy a newspaper, all that's been blown apart. All you need is the same browser, browser that allowed you to log on to Adobe Connect and join us today. That zero cost of distribution has opened up all sorts of opportunities for you. A few more words on the old model. The newspaper model was one way. Military and hierarchical in the way it behaved organizationally. On the web, however, the twin imperatives of news are immediacy and intimacy. Immediacy is not a big problem, but traditional news organizations have tremendous trouble with intimacy because it risks their gravitas. Twitter and other social media is both immediate and intimate. A good online news site should be really fast, be open, be conversational, and should use data intelligently. So, right about now, you're saying, why did I listen to a presentation on the destruction of mainstream media? Well, the answer is that when the Knowledge Translation Conference first approached me, they said they'd like me to speak about how to deal with the media. And my answer was, what media? You can deal with dying print and TV, and you're going to get some good advice on that. And for some, in some of your markets, uh, that remains a viable option. Or, as deer with guns, you have to think about conveying your message with your own tools and products. That's the shift that I'd like you to think about. In your mind's eye, consider that there are few organizations that can help you with your knowledge translation. It's up to you. You have to use the tools that this fantastic, amazing digital world has given you. That's certainly what you're doing today with declining budgets and the hassle of travel. Rather than traveling to a conference, you're tuned in to this meeting using your own tools. You're all dear. 
S-E-D-L has become a deer. They are taking the power by putting this conference on. You have to think about your own products. Not sure how many of you are doing this, but I believe if you are truly dedicated to knowledge translation in your special area, you have to think in terms of a blog. Don't pay any attention to the fact that blogs are done and blogs are passe. They're not. Blogs are tremendous for promoting your thoughts, your ideas, and your personal brand. And you must have a personal brand in today's world. I write two blogs, McGuire on Media, to promote my position as a media expert. Media folks who are left read blogs, and most of all, they Google. One of my tasks as an endowed share is to be oft-quoted. Well, people find my blog when they Google, they find uh, my hashtags, and they use me as an expert on the media. That allows me to have more influence than I might normally have. I've just started a book called McGuire on Life Disability, or started a blog, I'm sorry, called McGuire on Life, Disability, and Grief to promote my new book. Some people even take them home. I believe that that exposure is essential to getting my personal brand out there as an expert and a commentator in both these areas. I think you need to think in this way. I believe that while you can count on the local editor showing pity on you, I doubt it will happen. I cannot emphasize enough how besieged newsrooms are today. They want to do stories that count. They want to have an impact and yet they're doing them with anything from a third to 40%, to a third to two-thirds of the staff that they did them five, six, seven years ago. So for you, social media is crucial. I think you all ought to have Facebook and be on Facebook and be active. You ought to direct people to uh, the work you're doing. You ought to build a community with Facebook. What does build a community mean? Well, it means you're going to have to friend people that maybe you don't even really like that much. But the fact is you are a community of communicators, and you need to connect yourself to them. Same, table, same way with Twitter. Twitter is an important communications vehicle for certain kinds of people, mostly those with education, prestige, uh, multiple interests. You can touch a lot of people with Twitter. You need to use hashtags. Go to a site called Topsy.com. You can understand by looking at Topsy what hashtags are important in your area. Dis, uh, I use slash disability or hashtag disability. I use hashtag uh, uh, Down syndrome. Uh, I would bet there's a big hashtag area in rehabilitation. Look at those hashtags and try to understand what hashtags you ought to use on Twitter. Connecting to the right people Using Twitter analytics and Topsy is quite easy. Uh, most of you will be able to get it by dinging around. The point here is to build a community of your own. This entire participant list should be a Facebook and Twitter community. 
you would benefit tremendously by being in touch. And yeah, does that render this conference unnecessary perhaps for next year? Maybe. That's okay. They'll adjust. They'll figure it out. This group, every participant here, should be a part of a Facebook and Twitter community. Make it happen. You will become stronger. You will understand communications better. And you will help each other with the research and the work you do. The community gets strong enough to publish an online publish, publication for them. It's just a blog. It's easy. You go to WordPress. They give you themes. It is incredibly easy. The Even if you're sitting there right now and saying, my God, getting on to this conference was all I can handle technically, these tools are incredibly usable. They make it easy for you. They're intuitive. They make it easy to publish. They make it easy to do a blog. And as I said, social media is tremendously important. So if, if you have a community, how do you inform that community to engage? It's an important question because we all know that we have uh, great intentions but keeping a community together and engaged can be very difficult. So you've got to ask a lot of questions. Why do people need the information you provide? What's going to be relevant? What information do you have that people in your community are going to value? I don't know your area that well, but I imagine the, the trees are a flower with such information. Next question is, do you provide utility? Do you inform each other of uh, important discussions and conferences or important new papers uh, or important new developments? It would seem to me that I, I was struck uh, by uh, the opening presenter, Mr. Chita, well, I guess confusion, about how he was going to communicate uh, these new rules. If it was going to be through the Department of Education, what platform? Use these kinds of platforms. Use Facebook. Use Twitter. Keep this group informed through the usefulness of these electronic tools like Twitter. Yep. Do the things you cover matter to the community? Again, the same example. You know you're in a time of change. You know the things that matter. You know what's going to connect both in your individual Facebook and in your Twitter and in your blogs and in a community group blog. Those are the things that need to be addressed. You also need to say, what is your point of view, and how will you reflect it? I imagine, I hope I'm not too far out on a limb here, but I imagine there's some very mixed feelings about these changes. My view is that the more open the discussion is about those changes, the more successful you'll be. You'll understand them better. Then I think you have to ask, where and how do people want the information? Do you need an online publication? Should you do a WordPress uh, site? Uh, will Twitter and Facebook work? Uh, is there some uh, other third-party communication vehicle that might work? And then finally, you're always asking, how will you engage the audience? How do you make them loyal? How do you make this Whatever you do, matter. That's the key question in today's incredibly diverse media landscape. How do we make our stuff matter? So here are my signal lessons. The media world blew up, plain and simple. Is it dead? No, not really. 
your community newspaper is going to continue to publish for a while. Uh, if we have any people in Michigan, uh, they've already and uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, I think Cleveland has started, New Orleans clearly. Any, any of you who are in those areas know that you've gone to a, a newspaper that's about three or four times a week. That's going to happen increasingly, where to lower costs, newspapers are going to go to three or four days a week. I predict in the next year somebody will, some major news operation will go to Sunday only. Uh, and so working with your local mainstream organization is just not going to be very effective anymore. Another signal lesson is that only the very fittest are going to survive. When you have literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of media outlets, not everybody's going to make it. Your blog might get ignored unless you're uh, relevant and exciting and interesting. Uh, none of this is going to come without uh, careful investment, careful nurturing, and real attention to how audiences respond best. Another signal lesson was there is no core or central media anymore. Uh, it is too diverse. Uh, you have to figure out the audience you want and then go to the media outlets or build your own media outlets to serve that audience. We are simply not going to be in the shared experience era that so many of us grew up in. Where did you see in the paper that? Too many people are going to be reading too many different things. So that the fact that there's no core or central media is going to affect you dramatically. The deer have guns, and you are deer. Probably my main message. The tools of 2014 and the amazing things that are coming equip you to communicate in your own way with the audience you desire, with the effectiveness that you can muster to have a real effect on the people who need your research, need your understanding, and probably need your dialogue. That's an important point about the deer having guns. No longer are you just going to push out your research paper you're going to have to be able to discuss it with an audience. And you're going to have to be able to say, you know, maybe I didn't see that point clearly. That's not like it used to be. We all have to be bigger and more open to criticism and very positive, positive kind of impact and, and, and influence. Excuse me. You need to consider how you can communicate using these modern tools. Call your IT department. Go online. Mess around with Topsy and Twitter and Facebook. Ding around the web and find the new tools that are helpful. Again, you've got a built-in group, this participant list. Share great tools for communication that each of you have found. That is going to make you all better. Soon you'll all be technical wizards. Finally, become a genuine community. I believe this group does have the power and the ability to become a community that shares your tremendous insights and your tremendous gifts with a much wider audience. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tim. That really was very thought provoking. We do have one question that came in to us by way of Twitter. And that is, how does your experience as a parent of a child with a disability inform your approach as a journalist and vice versa? 
Well, uh, it certainly did and does. Uh, when uh, when I was a pra practicing journalist, I'll never forget the uh, time that we did a, uh, a story about the controversy that exists in every school district in America about the money being committed to uh, uh, special education uh, as opposed to choir and art and sports. And uh, those latter programs were clearly being robbed. And because legislators and the like simply weren't giving enough money to either one. And we did a project of that sort around 1997-1998. And a good part of the community in Minneapolis knew about uh, my son. And uh, the special education community, uh, uh, how shall I say politely, wanted me hung by the thumbs. And uh, I had to explain that I love Jason dearly, and I want him to have the very best education possible. But I had never felt that it was fair to deprive my other two children of sports and arts and choir and theater to fund Jason's education. And so I, I was held accountable that I wasn't favoring special education. Uh, didn't surprise me. Uh, if you're the editor of a major metropolitan newspaper, uh, you are quite comfortable with your uh, uh, back being a target. Uh, and I dealt with it just fine. But it always has been a, an issue. But it certainly has informed me. I think any of you in this area know that the greatest thing you can you gain is compassion and understanding uh, and I certainly understand special education most of you will be totally unsurprised to know that my oldest daughter is uh, a special education teacher and uh, uh, next month we'll get her master's in special education uh, Obviously, Jason has influenced our life. Uh, that's what a lot of the book does, uh, is talk about how uh, a Down syndrome disability, a cognitive disability, changes a family. In our case, it was very much for the better. And so that constantly informs me. I am constantly teach and view the media from a perspective of what are we doing for the least of our brethren. And I think my situation and uh, Jason's situation certainly inform that. Thank you. We have a couple more questions, and we are getting close to the end of time. Our next question says, how do you view the role of long format media, such as your um upcoming book, and how that relates to the social media formats that you're recommending? Yes, and. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful question, uh, and I think it shows a real understanding of the media world we, we live in today. And I think you need to occupy both. And uh, I would never, I mean, I live in an academic community now. Uh, I understand research and academics, and I hold you dear, D-E-A-R, not D-E-R. Uh, it's an important part of, uh, of our society. My belief, however, and I don't think you'd argue with me for very long, is much of that kind of work doesn't get public uh, discussion and debate. And I view short-form social media as a tremendous way to get it debated, to get it in front of the masses, to uh, make it a hot, interesting topic. Uh, I think most of our research can be translated quite effectively into short bits. The, the second blog I'm doing, the 
of McGuire on life, disability, and grief. Uh, the longest blog I ever do is 450 words, and most of them are 300, because I do believe that people want to be uh, informed and uh, moved uh, in small bits. At the same time, I feel very strongly that the book allows me to do a really strong memoir of the last, well, of my life and of Jason's 35-year life. And I can go into a level of detail and a level of emotion that I couldn't in short media. They have to coexist. They're both very important. Well, thank you very much, Tim. I think we have uh, run out of time. We're just a little bit over. But we do have a couple of other questions that we can hold until the discussion uh, later this afternoon after our next couple presentations. So I want to thank you very much, Tim. Um, Tim will be back later to participate in the interactive discussion at 3.15 Eastern Standard Time. And um, now we'll take a 10-minute break, and we'll convene right here at 1.25 for our next presentation. Thank you.